Thank you for visiting Harvest Anglican Church. We're so glad that you're here. We hope that you're blessed by this message, and we hope that you can join us next time we gather. So be sure to look at our website, harvestsc.org, and find the next worship event and join us. God bless you. Good morning, everybody, once again. It's good to see everybody out there. I was a little worried about after last week how I touched on uh, predestination, <laughs> that God was going to predestine a bunch of y'all not to show up again this week. So I'm glad that you're here, glad that you're back. Uh, if, if, that, if you weren't here last week, just go back and listen to the sermon, okay? Okay, I know I should do that. But we're in a, a series called God's New and Glorious uh, Society. We're talking through the book of Ephesians this summer. So again, we're exploring this sacramentally themed letter, okay, to the Ephesians. Still in chapter 1 today, we're still exploring the richness of being in Christ Jesus. Did I emphasize that enough? The richness of being in Christ Jesus. And again, who are those in Christ Jesus? Seems like a simple question. But... Those who are in Christ Jesus are those who, by God's grace, because none of us deserve it, by God's grace, believed in the Lord Jesus. You know, Jesus says in the Gospel of John, we talked about this in John 17, he says, hey, eternal life comes when we believe in the Lord Jesus. Jesus says, this is eternal life, that you believe in the one whom he has sent, who is Christ the Lord. So, those in Christ Jesus are those who believe and been baptized because belief and baptism, baptism always goes together, right? Hand in hand. Baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Baptized in the communion, not only with the triune God, but as Ephesians talks about, we're baptized into His body, the church, the bride of Christ, where the Holy Spirit dwells in all and fills all. Amen? As I said last week, this letter is for believers. And believers of all people. And that's very important, okay? Jews, Gentiles, all races, all colors, all social statuses, rich or poor, tigers and gamecocks, Baptists and Anglicans. Okay? It's for all the saints. That's what's so beautiful about the gospel. And that's what Paul is reiterating to us here in Ephesians. This is a magnificent prayer. A magnificent prayer that shows us, the saints, how to pray for the other saints out there. Our brothers and sisters in Christ, the church. It's a prayer for the church that she would increasingly discover, again, her richness in Christ Jesus. We are so blessed in the Lord. Do you know that? We are so blessed in the Lord. Blessed to be a blessing. Going all the way back to the Abrahamic promise. We are blessed to be a blessing. We are blessed to be an embodiment of God's incredible greatness. Of His mighty power on earth. Think about that. It's a shame that we don't think about this. It's a shame that we don't realize this. We are a part of God's mighty power on earth. As Jesus' mystical body on earth. God's new and glorious society whom Christ the Lord is head of. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. No, it's good. Let's face it. Let's face it. Most of us, including myself for so many years, had no clue. And I still don't have a clue because none of us have the immeasurable greatness of, of God's power and glory, riches, and all those things figured out yet. Okay, But most of us have no clue of the riches that we have already in Jesus. And too many of us have no clue of actually who He is. And who we are in Him as the church, His body. Jesus is everything. And we mean everything to Him. If we had any clue about this, we wouldn't be chasing so many idols and there wouldn't be a storage facility on every corner of every street. 
This week I read about a late newspaper publisher, William Randolph Hearst, who invested a fortune in collecting uh, valuable pieces of art from around the world, okay? And apparently Mr. Hearst saw a description of some valuable pieces of art, and so he just had to have them. So he sent his agent all around the world for months and months and months, spent so much money trying to find them, and the agent finally comes back and he says, Mr. Hearst, I found the items. You know where they are? They're in your warehouse. If you had just checked, if you had just checked the record of the catalog of your treasures, you would have known that you had it already. You see the parallel here? Because it's how it is with us sometimes as Christians. How few, quote unquote, Christians actually know God and know who they are as the body of Christ in Him. How few people have actually read the scriptures, the catalog of treasures, if you will, about him to discover the vast spiritual wealth that God has already put into your account in Christ Jesus. I mean, so many of us, and again, so many, for many of my years, I've just chosen to exist, right? Knowing Jesus not any better than I knew George Washington. And let me tell you, that doesn't end well if that's you. I need to say, I mean, if you want to make a note of Matthew 7, 22 and 23, it doesn't end well if you don't know Jesus any more than you know George Washington. Christ is Lord. Christ is Lord. Verse 20 says that he is seated, y'all. He's risen and reigning. He's ascended. He's at the right hand of the Father in the heavenly places. And we are with Him as the body of Christ. Okay? Far above all rule and authority and power and dominion. Jesus is King. We got to know this. We got to know this. This is Paul's prayer for the saints in Christ. That we know this, or more importantly, that we know Him. Honestly, I love this about, I'm going to brag on our prayer warriors for a minute. I love this about our prayer warriors. They come, there's a team of them that come every Sunday morning at 10 a.m. And they pray over every single chair. You know why? It's honestly, and they do it in the power and the grace of the Holy Spirit. Because we can't do anything on our own power, right? But they pray over every chair. Paul's prayer in a lot of ways. They pray that your eyes would be opened. Because that's what the Holy Spirit does. He opens eyes. They pray that your eyes will be opened to the glory of Jesus in this place and amongst us and as we go out into the world. They're praying that you experience His incredible love and mercy and forgiveness that He has for each and every one of us. It's awesome. If you think about it, people interceding on behalf of the saints to experience these things is such a beautiful of sacrificial love. Love that the true church of Jesus Christ should exude. And this is what Paul is encouraging us here in Ephesians 1. We talked about yesterday at the formation retreat that people are desperate to feel loved. I think that's what you said, Sandy. People are desperate to feel part of something, to feel love. Well, they are loved. We've got a message to say they are loved by God. And we should pray and love like Jesus. And I, I like Paul encourages us to pray and love that all people would come to know the saving knowledge of Jesus and really know Him. Not just know about Him, but know Him. We need to pray for the saints. Living saints. You know that? It's not talking about dead people. It's living saints. You and I and Jesus, we need to pray for the saints here at Harvest and everywhere that God would give us the spirit of revelation, Paul says. That he would give us the spirit of wisdom and knowledge of Jesus the Savior for his church. That God would open our eyes like he did with Hagar, even in our first reading today in Genesis, that he would open up our eyes to see the well of water right in front of us, Jesus the person of Jesus who gives us living water in the person of the Holy Spirit through baptism. Sorry, am I shouting? <laughs> we need to pray that God would open up our eyes to this. 
especially as we come to his table today, that we, were, that we would see that we are his bride and that this is the marriage supper and that we are in complete unity. We are in complete union with Jesus, totally inseparable as, as a head is inseparable from a body or as a, a husband should be inseparable from his wife. And we'll get more into that later on in Ephesians. Pray that God would help us to see that. And as Jesus said in Matthew 10, pray that, that, we, are, that we would know as we come to this table today that you are so valuable to Him. Did you hear that? All, every hair on your head is numbered. That you are so much more valued than many sparrows, He said. And that we are, pray that you would know that you are loved as His glorious inheritance. We are precious and we need not be afraid. Did you hear Jesus say that a couple times? Don't be afraid. Going back to Matthew 10 for just a moment, we need to pray also that God would open up our eyes to know that persecution, sickness, sometimes suffering, rejection, and yes, sometimes even death are things that we may have to endure on this earth like Jesus did. But that, listen, all things have been put under his feet. It's very important. All the stuff that we experience and endure has been put under his feet. Because we go through these things does not mean that God does not love us. It just means in those times that we can know and trust with confidence that the victory has already been won at the cross and resurrection. Right? And we can know the hope to which he has called us. Paul talks about in Ephesians, going back to there again. We can know the hope to which he has called us, the certain hope of glory in and with Christ Jesus. Amen. What a glorious truth for the body of Christ. Isn't it cool? I didn't change everything. You are so valuable. You are so loved. I mean, did you notice in verse 18... That we are his glorious inheritance. Look at what Paul says. Having the eyes of your hearts enlightened that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. You know, for so long, I read those verses and I saw words like riches and inheritance and so on and so forth. And I thought that the inheritance was about me. About what I was going to get when I got to heaven. Tell me that doesn't reveal something about our selfish hearts. Look carefully. It's not about us. We are God's glorious inheritance. You are His treasure. <laughs> We, the body of Christ, are His treasure. He loves you so much. And it's not just when we get to heaven, y'all. It's now. Now. So many people miss this. And Paul is pleading not to be blind to this reality. Because our present and our future heavenly reality in Jesus changes everything. Even now. Especially now. Our entire perspective on things changes. When we know who Jesus is and who we are in Him. Okay? I don't think they would mind me sharing this but, because he's one of my best friends, but how in the world can Stacy and Andrew Sizemore, our previous youth director, and his wife, if you didn't know that, one of my best friends, how can they exude such passionate love for Jesus when every day Stacy is in the fight of her life with cancer. A young woman, two young kids. How can they exude such passionate love for Jesus in the midst of this? I'll tell you how. And it's based on Ephesians 1. I would say that, that Andrew and Stacy can do this. And I would say that many other saints throughout history can do this because they know Jesus. It ain't like they know Jesus like George Washington. They know him. 
They truly, fully know. Look at verse 19. They know the immeasurable greatness of His power toward us who believe. Andrew and Stacy believe. They know the working of His great might that He worked in Christ when He raised Him from the dead and seated Him at His right hand in the heavenly places far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only now in this age, but in the age to come. The saints know this, that Christ is head over all things for us, for His church. He's in control. I heard Matt Chandler say this one time. I think he's the pastor of the village in Texas, and I loved it. Matt Chandler said, Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father. He is not scrambling around the throne room wondering to do, wondering what to do about these things. He's seated in all authority. And so we need not fear. Jesus said that in the gospel. Don't fear anyone or anything. Are you listening? Don't fear anything or anyone. In fact, he says the only one you need to fear is the one who can cast your soul into hell. And that's not us. Okay? That's not us as the body of Christ. So I want to thank you for the ways that this church has prayed for and continue to love and support Andrew and Stacy and their precious kids, Logan and Anna Claire. I'm going to go out on a limb and say that Paul would probably write to us like he does in verse 15 saying, because I've heard of your faith and your love toward all the saints like Andrew and Stacy and so many others that we have loved on here. I don't cease to give thanks for you in my prayers. You see that? And the reason I can go on a limb and say that Paul would probably be right this, and I want us to ponder this as well, because last week we talked about in Ephesians 1.4 how God chose us before the foundation of the world, right? But does that mean we sit on our laurels and don't go forth in faith and love and action? No. Paul says this. Look at what he says today. This comfort should never take away our zeal living out our faith in this world, right? He says, I have heard of your faith. And your love. Paul hears of their faith in action, you see, that flowed out of worship as Christ's body, and he celebrated. They didn't sit on their chosenness. He heard of their love and action that flowed out of worship, and he celebrated. Isn't that a beautiful thing? So the people hear of our faith, and our love. Paul planted. Uh, uh, the church at Ephesus, we were planted out of St. Paul's church in T. Brown. Does T. Brown hear of our faith for the saints and celebrate? Yes, he does. Do we do the same? Do we thrill at hearing of the faith and love of others in Christ's body? We're about to join in fellowship in a lot of ways with Temple Baptist Church in Simpsonville. Will we rejoice in their spiritual attainments? Will they in ours? Aren't we supposed to be united? Aren't we supposed to be connected as Christ's body? Absolutely. God smiles when we are one. I love Paul's prayer. And you can tell he's an apostle and an ultimate church planner because he holds the church, all fellow Christians, in his heart through prayer. And he celebrates their faith and their Christ-like love. So I challenge us, y'all. I challenge us to think and pray bigger than maybe we ever have before. Okay? It's why I love the Lord's Prayer as well. It's, as well. it's communal. It's not individualistic, which we have become so individualistic in our uh, relationships and with Christ in the church. It is communal. Commu- communal. I can't talk today. Jesus says in his prayer, pray like this. Our Father. 
my Father, our Father. You know, give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us. So on and so forth. Prayer is so big as the body of Christ. It's a waterfall of grace that we can pray on behalf of others. Isn't that awesome? And again, prayers like that can not only change entire perspective about circumstances, but prayers like that can change entire communities, entire cities. Because when we pray like that, it means that the faithful saints have proper perspective about who Jesus is, that He is high and lifted up, and that all authority is under Him. They recognize that, and they also know who they are in Him. Precious, loved, and empowered. God's mighty power is working in and through you. But He's not going to force Himself on you. We have to be submissive to that as the body of Christ. This is God's hope as His new and glorious society, His church. That we go forth according to His great might to share Christ's love with all people. This is so, so good for us. Amen. Paul, again. As I close, Paul is praying that we know Jesus and that that we, by the Spirit, daily increase in our real intimate knowledge of Him because He is the rock, okay? He is the rock which His new and glorious society is firmly established upon, okay? Paul is praying that you know Jesus because to know Jesus is salvation. So if you don't know Jesus more than George Washington, today is the day. The first day of the rest of your life. Don't leave this place without praying with Pat or I. Okay? Know that you're loved. Know that you are accepted just as you are, but God's not going to leave you there. To know Jesus is salvation. That's John 17, 3. To know Him increasingly is sanctification in the Spirit. Like He's praying here in Ephesians. Like He will go on and pray in Colossians. Like He says in Philippians 3, verse 10. Sanctification. To know Him perfectly is glorification when we see Him face to face. And you can see that scripture in 1 Corinthians 13, 9 through 12. So I guess the question to be asked of us today is today the day. Is today the day that Paul's prayer will be answered in our lives as the body of Christ? I pray so. I pray so because God, the Spirit of God, because He's a good, good Father, is so willing to fill you all with increasing wisdom, with increasing knowledge and revelation of Jesus. He's willing to enlighten our eyes to the certain hope to which He has called us. He's willing because He's good. He's willing to show you what the incredible riches are of His glorious inheritance in you, the saints. He's willing to show you the immeasurable greatness of His power toward us who believe. So I pray today that you will know eternal life. What is eternal life? To believe in the one whom God has sent. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit.